I'm happy to be here now to explain the work we have been doing with um, a nanomedicine approach to treat stroke which is the main uh, topic of research in my lab. Um, I come from Valdebron Research Institute in Barcelona, which is a hospitality complex, uh, very large um, in Barcelona, and we have a research institute. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the work and the help of uh, some of my collaborators who have directly contributed in the work I will be explaining today to you. Um, and most of them has been involved in a Euronanomed funded project called MacBridge, which just ended, especially to Dr. Anna Roch and her team at um, Institute of Materials of Barcelona, who have developed uh, nanoparticles I will be talking about today, and the other collaborators who have contributed to different parts of the work, as you will see, and also other collaborators from my hospital, working with 3D printed models and other research centers in Spain who, who have helped with the imaging and the tissue imaging too, the in vivo and the tissue imaging. So I will start my talk um, um, explaining what stroke is. So I will start with, for, with the medicine part and then I will drive you to the nano uh, part of the talk. So stroke is a disease that has a very high impact. You should remember signs of a stroke, um, which are shown here, and, and this must be considered a medical emergency. Um, most healthcare um, institutes or um, healthcare providers, they have a stroke code because it's very important to act very fast when someone is suspected to have a stroke. And as you know, a stroke can be caused by the vessel rupture inside the brain or by the vessel obstruction by a clot. The second one is the most uh, prevalent and is the one uh, I will be talking today and has a huge impact worldwide, like the World Health Organization um, estimates that more than 15 million people have a stroke every year. And of these 5 million die and another 5 million remain permanently disabled because of the neurological uh, deficits that carry these diseases. And at biological level in the brain, it's like a, a tsunami or like a big storm because um, each minute when this uh, cerebral blood flow is interrupted, about 2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses and um, 12 kilometers of myelinated fibers are destroyed. So you can imagine that in a few minutes, um, if this um, vessel obstruction is not resolved, uh, it can lead to very severe uh, neurological deficits. So what we have nowadays to treat a stroke. So we have a stroker units. These uh, are very important. In the hospitals, we have a specialized stroke professionals with a specific patients monitoring and care. In some cases, patients should undergo um, some type of surgeries. Uh, but uh, the treatments that change stroke um, management in the last decades, decades have been uh, the intravenous administrations of GPA, which dissolves the clot that is obstructing the brain, and more recently, the endovascular procedures which um, with an intervention, they can reach the brain vasculature that is obstructing the artery if these are large, um, these are occlusions in large vessels and they can remove it from the brain. This happens only, uh, this can be administered only in a percentage of patients and the characteristic is that has to be ad administered or provided very, very early. So we are talking about hours only after the symptoms start. So for this, um, less than 15% of stroke patients are nowadays receiving a treatment. And we should remember that we also have rehabilitation for those patients who survive with neurological deficits. They still have programs to recover from these um, neurological functions that are impaired. But it's uh, obvious that we need new treatments um, for these patients. So uh, just a reminder of what happens in the brain when a stroke occurs. 
we know when has been largely studied, this is chemic cascade that starts with an energy failure. And then we have oxidative stress, inflammation, and finally we have cellular necrosis and apoptosis, which leads to uh, neurovascular degeneration and, and death. But um, we also have a spontaneous recovery. This is now for the last decades. And we know, we don't know the exact, exact timeline, um, but we know that there are uh, cell survival pathways activated, angiogenesis, cell, proliferate, cell proliferation, remyelinization also occurs. Um, and this all leads to brain plasticity and neuro repair, which can be also target of uh, new treatments for a stroke. Um, we have also changed the neurogenic view of the brain, um, trying to only rescue neurons from dying. And um, neuroscientists have also realized that the brain, it's, uh, it's beyond neurons. And there's this neurovascular unique concept where um, we have understood that neurons uh, connect, communicate, with other cell types that are supportive or that are part of the brain vasculature too. Um, and these cells are also affected by a stroke and are also should be also targets for future treatments. And to make this even more complicated, um, we also have learned that we have um, neurogenesis, we have um, some of the recovery the pro um, processes are based on the, the migration, proliferation, and differentiation of some neurogenic uh, cells that we have in, in, in two niches in the brain, in the subventricular zone and in the um, subgranular zone of the hippocampus, which have um, normal physiological patterns um, that, but when a stroke happens, this changes and these physiological patterns of migration and differentiation change and these neural progenitor, progenitors move to the lesion site. And why I say this? Because um, in the last years, we have learned that for this neurogenesis to occur, it's it's very important to have a vascular support. And vascular, I mean microvascular. So we need uh, vascular remodeling. We need uh, to have healthy and proliferating microvessels supporting these um, neuroblast or neural stem cells. Um, and when we inhibit this, um, this vascular remodel, this endothelial cell remodeling, neurogenesis does not occur after a stroke. And some of these neurogenic uh, pool cells have been identified even in the human brain, always uh, close to microvessels. So um, with this background, our interest in the last year has been the study of endothelial progenitor cells, which were identified um, a couple of decades ago as circulating cells in the blood in humans, uh, coming from the bone marrow and um, able to differentiate into endothelial cells and form new, new blood vessels. As you can see, they became a paradigm for, uh, for endothelial regeneration and vessel repair after stroke, arthrosclerosis, traumatic brain injury. So these cells are um, released after the, we have normal levels, but they increase after injury and they can um, go to the vessel wall or secrete factors to stimulate resident endothelial cells or even incorporate in these new uh, form vessels. Um, we know that we can isolate these cells from different um, biological fluids or organs. Um, they are, we work with the blood source in humans and with the spleen source in mouse models. Uh, we can culture them, we can characterize them, and we can expand them. So these uh, late populations, they outgrow populations, they proliferate, and these are the ones I'm going to talk with you with their regenerative potential. I will show you also um, stroke models that we can nicely reproduce in mice, uh, similar with similar presentation than in humans. And one important thing, it's the mouse brain vasculature it's very similar to the human one with this um, polygon of Willis and one middle cerebral artery and the posterior territory also. So this is important for us. Um, we have 
learned and we have shown that um, these, in this case, uh, spleen derived endothelial progenitor cells from mouse labeled uh, when we administer them after a stroke in a mouse model. Um, we can, they can reach the brain and we can find them um, located in microvessels um, of the post-stroke brain. Um, and when we administer this cell therapy treatment, we increase the microvessel density in these peri-infarct areas, which is supported, supportive for uh, neural recovery. But the amount of cells that we find is very tiny. We administer one million cells um, and we just count a few, a few dozens of cells. And this is something that is shown in different um, cell therapy approaches, also in other diseases. So some years ago, um, it was proposed that perhaps some of these progenitor of stem cells could be uh, acting um, through the secretome, um, all these factors that they secrete, and actually they are just carriers of these factors, which are the true um, repair um, agents uh, for the tissue that um, it's, it's injured. And evidences have been shown by other authors in highline ischemia, diabetic ulcers, myocardial infarction, and stroke, where we have shown also that in a cortical model in mouse, if we administer the secretome in a cell-free but cell-based approach, we can increase vessel density and functional recovery. And also in a model of chronic hypoperfusion in the brain, which leads to white matter um, degeneration, if we also administer this secretome therapy uh, from EPCs, we also see that um, white matter is remodeled and, um, through oligovascular remodeling and improving also cognitive function in these animals. So with this background, what we have seen um, that EPC secretome uh, may orchestrate vascular remodeling in ischemic tissues and maybe the true therapeutic potential of these cell-based therapies. That cells, um, despite the benefit that they show in these cell therapy treatments, they have poor cell engraftment, even at long time, and even when they are administered in, in situ, which um, in the brain is um, very invasive. Um, and at the end, pharmacological and cell therapy products are being tested in the preclinical and clinical studies. But the main critical challenge ahead is efficient delivery. And we have seen this today, for example, with the intranasal delivery also reaching the brain um, and in other organs, but um, the brain has a special characteristic with difficult access. So that's when we thought the nanotechnology could help us to, um, to better deliver this cell secretome in a cell-based but cell-free approach in a non-invasive um, regenerative treatment to enhance this vascular remodeling, um, encapsulating this secretome in polymeric biodegradable and biocompatible nanocapsules labeled with magnetic nanoparticles, which will allow us to um, tag them um, for the tracking and also for the magnetic guidance, as I will see you. So for this, um, our collaborators from ICMAP um, at Material Science Institute in Barcelona. With them, we have been working in the past years producing these PLGA-based um, um, nanocapsules. PLGA, as you know, it's a FDA-approved polymer for nanomedical formulations. It's biocompatible. And in our case, we have been uh, producing these nanocapsules, which have an average size of 270 nanometers with very um, small polydispersity. And also, um, we have um, decorated them with spions, um, which have magnetic properties and also are, um, are a good contrast agents in T2 imaging. So you can see these characteristics here of how they look like. They have this, um, this, um, the, this accord shell with this area inside where we can introduce or we can um, put our uh, secretome. And um, they have these magnetic properties. They can be um, 
retain when a magnetic field is placed in these uh, nanocaps uh, nanocapsule solutions, and they show very nice contrast agent as a contrast agent in MRI, in T2 MRI. So um, they are being prepared by double ohm, standard double motion solvent evaporation method together with the superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles and functionalized with, with tags for MRI, PET, and, and fluorescent molecular imaging. I will show you this through the talk. Um, we have a very, uh, our colleagues have a very robust method um, of synthesis. They have produced more than 200 batches and the size is very consistent. And we have also produced in parallel the, the blood derived uh, from blood derived endothelial progenitor cell cultures, uh, the secretome. We did this at, uh, let's say, laboratory level, but we have also collaborated with Pure Biologics from Poland. Um, and they, uh, they grow the cells in small bioreactors and they are able to produce very standard batches of secretum with these characteristics. Uh, and we can, we can work these batches from one to three milligrams of fluorine. Um, we have analyzed by several methods there. We have done complete proteomics, but to simplify, here I show you uh, oligoarrays um, looking for angiogenesis related proteins. We found more than 30 proteins in this, in this secretome. In proteomics, they show more than 1,000 proteins, okay? But what I want to show you here is that in different routes that we produce, it's very consistent. Um, the amount of factors that we have in this, um, in this soup, in this cocktail of secretome, and this produced um, secretum, it's functional and it's therapeutic. In vitro, we see how if we work, we, we have endothelial cells in culture, um, basal media, it's a control media, and secretum, it's the, med the basal media that contains the products produced by the endothelial progenitor cells. So in red, you can see that um, we see more proliferation of endothelial cells in this case, mouse endothelial cells, and this is those dependent. And with um, some of these concentrations, we can also enhance tube formation in vitro, which is also um, angiogenesis-like um, experiment for, for in vitro endothelial cells. With human um, endothelial cells, um, we can also see similar effects. Um, the secretome producing different batches uh, produces um, cell proliferation in these endothelial cells, similar to the control molecule, um, which is BGA. We can also induce tube formation of these human endothelial cells, and we can also induce um, um, cellular um, endothelial cell migration in this wound healing assay. So um, let's let it's an effect that it's similar to V to VGF, which will be a a control protein for endothelial cell um, stimulation. Um, it's also important that in a BBB model, um, our collaborators from, from LENS, from France, they are experts in BBB models. Um, they, they show how this uh, increase of permeability that is produced by OGD can be completely recovered in the presence of the secretome of endothelial progenitor cells. And this is um, also accompanied by an increase of type Jackson proteins, such as claudine 5 or ZO1 in these BBB models. And when we, we, we uh, administer or we expose this BBB model uh, to the complete nanocapsule formulation, uh, this is non-toxic, uh, which is important. And in endothelial cell cultures, this is not in the BBB model, these are endothelial cells in culture, we see how these nanocapsules here in red, they are internalized in the endothelial cells, which will be part of this BBB in the, in the, in the brain. About uh, protein release and drug loading, uh, we first tested this with albumin uh, as a cargo protein showing uh, 
almost 50% encapsulation efficiency and a release which um, was consistent in the first week and then was stabilized, stabilized in the second week. And for the encapsulation of our secretome, we saw similar um, encapsulation efficiencies uh, when looking at three of these protein contained in the, in the secretome of EPCs. Uh, and also, we also can observe how uh, biodegradation occurs of the capsule, and um, we assume that um, these proteins are released during um, this um, degradation. Actually, if we allow these capsules to release uh, the content uh, for here two hours or two days, and we collect this release media uh, in red, you can see how um, also, this is dose dependent. We can see uh, an impact on endothelial cell proliferation when treating with these release um, products from the nanocapsules. And I move to the last part of the talk, which is um, the tracking of these um, of these capsules, which is very important because we think that uh, I will show you how we have improved the brain targeting and the brain retention which is the main challenge um, for in vivo treatment. So as you all know, when we administer nanocapsules or nanomaterials intravenously, um, they mainly go to abdominal organs such as the liver. Here you can see uh, the liver before the administration and then after the, the administration, um, you can see um, the liver more hypodense and more black or blue. Um, this is because of the spions that are um, um, decorating our nanocapsules. And this was also seen in PET when the nanocapsules were labeled with zirconium. Um, we also observed this, um, uh, this expected abdominal retention. Uh, but what is more important is the amount of nanocapsules in the brain. This was a naive animal known as chemic one. Um, in, in several animals that we did this administration, that the amount that reaches the brain, it's, um, it, it's, it's very, very small, almost nothing. Um, then we did molecular imaging with the fluorescent tags of these nanocapsules, and we see those dependent um, response uh, with this technique, and also human plasma, uh, mix in vivo with the nanocapsule, it's able to, to, to show this fluorescence. And in vivo, actually, when we administer these fluorescent label nanocapsules uh, very quickly, we can see them um, located in the abdominal organs, very few signal in the brain, which actually this is not inside the parenchyma, this is in the venous sinus um, outside the parenchyma, because when we remove the brains from these animals, as you can see here, there's almost there's no signal in the brain when these capsules are administered intravenously, but they reach other organs like the lung, the liver, or the spleen. So the most important thing um, for any uh, therapy it's in the brain is to improve this delivery. Well, this just, is just showing that it was not toxic. So as I told you at the beginning of my talk, a stroke patients are now receiving um, thrombectomies. This is an endovascular treatment where a uh, microcatheter is introduced through the femoral brain and reaches the intracranial arteries to remove the clot. So we thought that this is, an, this is actually done in our hospitals in a daily basis. So we thought that we can start them administering these nanomaterials through this route in the case of a stroke. Uh, because actually the gate is there and uh, neurologists um, or radiologists are reaching uh, the, the, the entrance of the brain um, quite easily nowadays. And we did the first steps administering the same nanocapsules with a fluorescent tax through the intraarterial approach. In this case, in mouse, we use the internal carotid artery. And actually the amount, as you can see, the amount of nanocapsules reaching the brain um, was uh, much larger. Uh, it was intraparenchymal. This is a slice of the, of the brain and you can see a lot of signal located in the 
um, hemisphere where the um, catheter was introduced and not in the ipsilat in the contralateral part. And by MRI, when we track the nanocapsules um, for the spion signal, we can also see all these dark spots here. So this is a huge improvement that we wanted to even um, uh, make it larger with the magnetic targeting, taking advantage of the spions decorating these nanocapsules. So um, we work first with permanent marker, uh, magnets and our collaborators from Slovakia, they built new focus magnets with a uh, better magnetic field and magnetic forces. Uh, which can be placed in the brain in the case of in the case of the mice we, we should go below the the skin because it's very thick and improve the retention of these um, capsules that they reach the brain um, very fast um, so here you can see how we implant this in the mouth this is done in like two minutes it's very easy and this is how we produce we inject the 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 nanocapsules um, in humans, this is done through the femoral, main, femoral vein, but because of the size of the arteries, we use this um, um, internal carotid artery. Um, it's the same artery that we use to induce the ischemia model, so technically it's not much complicated. So um, what I will show you here, it, as you can see with the intraarterial administration, after ischemia also, um, uh, this is, sorry, these are, these are naive mice, sorry. Um, we can reach, as I showed you before, um, the brain much easier. This is significant even when we place a fake mice here because of the interarterial delivery. But if we look at the brain um, carefully and we divide the cortex and the subcortex, we see also that the, um, the site of the interarterial administration with a magnet, um, uh, with the magnet place uh, in the cortex, increases even more the levels of, of fluorescence in this area. This also happens in the subcortex. This is actually safe when we do a ischemia model with an anocapsule administration interarterially. We don't see larger infarcts. Um, there's no clotting of the, nanocapsule, of the nanocapsules increasing in far size. There are no more hemorrhages, which are the most uh, uh, threatening complications in a stroke. And um, neurological deficits um, were not worse after the nanocapsule administration. Um, what we saw um, is that with the permanent magnet designed by our collaborators, we enhance and we increase the amount of nanocapsules retained um, in the brain. This is uh, shown in vivo and ex vivo uh, in brain quantification and also shown here by MRI um, tracking the, the nanocapsules with the spions. Um, and actually was more significant in the cortex because the, magnetic, the magnet was placed here uh, in this case here, and with uh, with a three millimeters more or less uh, action field. At tissue level, this is the ipsilateral hemisphere of the administration. We saw that the nanocapsules were actually in uh, vessel structures, micro vessel structures. As I showed before, they can internalize into endothelial cells. And here you can see a merge signaling between lectin that stains vessels and the CY7 uh, signal from our nanocapsules. And to finish, I will just show you how we are working to, uh, in the future, demonstrate that th this can be translated uh, into humans. We have also worked uh, to build a, a human magnet um, adapted to the brain anatomy of humans and also to some specific um, stroke characteristics. Our colleagues from uh, Cosice, um, they did this, this work. And with um, our colleagues uh, from the Stroke Unique and Stroke Lab in my center, um, who have these nice 3D uh, vascular models of the supraortic vasculature. Uh, this, is, this will be the supraortic vasculature from humans, and this is what they have built. They have a perfusion system where you can place 
the microcatheter that is used in humans, and you can reach the internal carotid artery as we did in mice, and you can deliver the nanocapsule infusion here, and with this skull also made uh, with the, actually with the uh, standard size in humans, and the magnet placed behind. We can see how in a few minutes, obviously there are not other organs here, okay, but uh, with this system, uh, in a few minutes, we can see this dark spot uh, shown in the arrow. And after one hour, we see a lot of nanocapsules retained in this area of influence of the magnetic field, even with the skull um, structure in the middle. And uh, with the fluorescent imaging, we can also see that the retention of nanocapsules increase in this site of the magnetic field implantation and intraarterial administration than in the contralateral side. And the last thing is that we are also testing this in porcine uh, model and not in the stroke model. This is naive animals just to prove in a large animal if this was um, safe um, because you know that in uh, pigs and in humans there are some reactions to um, to nanomaterials administration, which are the carpal reactions. And actually with this same, with the human um, endovascular approach of um, thrombectomies, we can reach this part of the, of the brain just before this red emirabile, which we don't have in humans. And we deliver the nanocapsules here. And as you can see, we can retain and we can have much more nanocapsules in the site of infusion and it's also important to, to, to say that the, the amount of nanocapsules circulating in blood was there just for a few minutes, okay? After one hour, almost no nanocapsules in blood. So we have only a few minutes to retain these capsules in the brain because then they spread to the whole body and they also go to other organs. So um, to finish and to sum up, uh, we have designed biocompatible nanocarriers to encapsulate cell secreton factors, to repair with multiple tags for multimodal imaging, guidance and retention under a local magnetic field. This strategy is safe as demonstrated in vitro and in vivo. The therapeutic EPC secretome triggers vascular remodeling on endothelial cells and offers BBB protection. Um, in, in oxygen glucose deprivation models and preserves the function of this secretome after the nanocapsule release. The therapeutic nanocapsules, we have been able to safely deliver them acutely by endovascular approaches, maximizing the arrival into the brain and favoring its rotation uh, by the magnetic fields. And the most important thing is that uh, we have learned that nanomedicine can be part of a stroke treatment in the future, but we have to work a lot on optimize clinically relevant, relevant delivery approaches, um, as we have seen here, or uh, in my colleague's uh, presentation before with intranasal administrations, perhaps. So last thing is to uh, present my, my lab uh, in the Valdebron Research Institute, um, especially those persons who have been um, done most of the work I presented today, Alba Greyston, who's doing the in vivo models, Miguel Garcia, who is working with the uh, cell cultures and the release um, studies, and Yajie, who did the thesis between my lab and the Material Science Institute in Barcelona, uh, graduated last year, and he is the uh, main uh, manufacturer and the one that did this nice multimodal uh, PLGA nanocapsules for, for the stroke treatment. So thank you very much. I will take any questions you may have. Thank you, Anna. Um, so can you elaborate on how you put the magnet to guide the accumulation of your nanoparticles to the stroke side uh, in the in vivo setting? Yeah, um, in the mice, um, the idea is to put it um, close to the, to, in a stroke, you, you have to do a neuroimaging for sure uh, to, to diagnose a stroke, okay? A person has symptoms and the neuroimaging is needed. This will help us to, 
to guide where a stroke is located. And then this magnet could be placed in humans uh, because we have a very thin skin in the, in the cranium. This can be placed directly in the, in the case of the mice because the skin is very thick. Um, and we, have, we open it and we just glue it on the top of the skull. Uh, we know very well where the stroke is it's induced in mice and we just put it in the area where a stroke is induced. Um, the idea, sorry, is that these magnets in humans um, will not be implanted, you know, this is wearable and you can put and remove um, as other magnets are used um, in the clinical practice in humans. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so if no other questions, um, then we will uh, just uh, hear and thank all the uh, speakers okay, uh, in this section. So thank you very much and uh, back to you, Earth.